Hello, everyone. Um, how are you? Good evening. Um, I'm Michael Govan, uh, Director and CEO of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And uh, <clears throat> a special evening tonight in our continuing series of conversations with artists. Um, we're very happy to have with us tonight uh, Jorge Pardo. Um, I should uh, also mention, just to say, brief advertisement, that we'll have the next conversation will be uh, with uh, Chris Burden, who did the amazing 202 street lamps that now uh, grace the entrance of the museum. And that conversation will be on Thursday, November 6th. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about Jorge's art, other art, uh, interesting issues. Uh, Jorge Pardo, for those of you who do not know, uh, lives in Los Angeles currently, but he was born in Havana in 1963, and he uh, moved to the United States when he was six years old. Uh, remembers that uh, very strongly. He moved to Chicago and then moved to uh, Los Angeles where he went to Art Center College of Design right here in Los Angeles. And um, he's been a real force in the art world since his first exhibitions in Los Angeles in 1990 or around there. Um, and he's an artist that I have followed for a very long time. And, and later I'll show you some slides of uh, some images of another project that we worked on uh, together. I had the pleasure of working with him on in, in New York. Um, but just to say a few words about the work and we'll explore it more fully. Um, the amazing thing about Jorge Pardo's work that I find so fascinating is how he has embedded this incredible paradox um, of an artwork that it on one hand um, is in some ways to quote Matisse's, uh, Henri Matisse's ambition for painting as comfortable as an armchair uh, and as beautiful and as colorful if you imagine Matisse's paintings and at the same time he engages those very essential modernist questions that you might associate with a Marcel Duchamp who's asking what is an artwork at its very core and this ability to fuse the um, that kind of Matissean side and the Duchampian side is, is something that I think um, no other artist has really ever accomplished. And it's uh, something that's been uh, a guiding light for me in thinking about what's possible in contemporary art. His work can be disarming. Uh, it can be surprising. You can be in it and not even know you're in it, as somebody told a story recently about being in a bar or restaurant where most people in that bar or restaurant don't even know that it's an artwork by Jorge Pardo. And uh, he has, uh, we've worked together during the last year and a half, uh, working very closely uh, with, he's worked very closely with uh, Virginia Fields, who's our curator of pre-Columbian art, to create this installation that you've seen uh, on the fourth floor of the Art of the Americas building. Uh, it's been talked about, it's been uh, talked about as very controversial. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, it certainly stirred conversation in the press and now the art magazines, and in part that was, uh, was, uh, I wouldn't say planned in that sense of planning for controversy, but we knew we were taking a risk. And there were many risks taken in that installation. Uh, our curator, Virginia Fields, who is, as you know, one of the, you may or may not know, one of the leading lights in that field and has done many fantastic exhibitions here at LACMA um, and around the world. Uh, we, together, we decided that we would um, experiment. And so not only is the installation an experiment, but when you get into what's shown and how it's shown, uh, Virginia has created a very non-traditional organization of objects, uh, even including a whole room devoted mostly to Central American, ancient American objects, which you never see in a museum setting. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. The project was conceived in that spirit exactly to create interest and dialogue and discussion about Latin American art, as the title says, from ancient to modern and to bridge these ideas. So uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, Jorge's other work. And so please welcome uh, Jorge Pardo. Is this working? Hello? Um, I'd also like to thank... Uh, several people, uh, this installation 
that you've seen upstairs would not have been possible without the sponsorship of many people, including uh, one of our trustees, uh, David Bonnet, uh, friends from New York, um, Ann Tenenbaum and Thomas H. Lee, and uh, people who are with us here tonight and in Los Angeles, uh, uh, Eugenio Lopez, and in particular, Ramiro and Gabriel Garza. So I'd like to offer thanks to them for sponsoring this experiment. So. Um, many of you have, I hope all of you have seen the installation, uh, and you see it starts in the foyer of the fourth floor of the Art of the Americas building, and Ilona Katsu and Virginia decided to begin with this pairing, uh, one, a case showing some of our more important pre-Columbian figures, and this Rivera painting, which is a portrait of an American businessman, but if you see in the background, uh, a sort of idealized and simplified pre-Columbian figure. And I, I read this portrait very strongly as um, putting behind this modern man uh, a different origin, uh, an ancient American origin, as opposed to a European or traditional classical origin. And so that idea of thinking about a different origin uh, for art, other than uh, more classical Greek and Rome or European origin, I think is what is at stake here in the largest sense. Um, and I'll just, uh, there are a few photographs to, to show this here. Um, we began this project, in fact, over a year ago <clears throat> with a uh, travel. Uh, Jorge and I traveled with Virginia uh, to the Yucatan and we visited museums and looked at case design and how artworks were presented and also went to ancient sites and stayed up late uh, talking about uh, what was possible and talking about this relationship between ancient and modern. And uh, Jorge, I think you, it was almost before that trip and just after, after that you seized upon this uh, form of these um, MDF boards that uh, seem to travel endlessly in a horizontal plane. And I know you had a bit of that idea ahead of time. You were thinking about it formally. And I'm curious, I, I, we really didn't talk about where that idea came from, where, the, where that form came from. So um, thank you, Michael, for having me up. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, you know, when I was. I'm, I'm not somebody who's sort of traditionally invested in these type of objects. It's, um, so it's not, I don't come from it, to it from uh, any, any kind of, uh, any position of expertise or anything, obviously. But what I am interested in is this, this sort of, the problem of presenting things and how presentation can actually, um, more than just present. In other words, it can, it can sort of kind of uh, restructure the way, you, the way the thing is. In other words, it can kind of reanimate something. And what I wanted, what I was thinking, when I, what I wanted to do was try to kind of set up a kind of an exhibition system that instead of it being kind of a, like a, a series of, of, uh, of sort of boxes and jumps and things that you go, that, that it was really kind of more like part of, a, of, a, of almost like a, like a zipper or something like that. And, and the zipper would sort of run around the space and then you would have these kind of things that would come out and, and that, that would just reflect you know, it, it's some sort of motion, but not necessarily like the to, like chronological motion, and uh, and just and it's a very simple idea. I mean, it's just basically the layers are just you know they're they're just about what they are, and they sort of you know obviously invoke the sort of sedimentation of some sort of that time, and and the colors are really things that we worked to. Uh, they're colors that I think actually uh, pull information from the pieces that uh, that. Uh, that's in them, and it's interesting to me, and they're, and they're kind of impossible to see without them. Um, so it's, it's, that's kind of the program. It's pretty straightforward. Um. Here's a great moment where um, Jorge is being very playful, and uh, rather than sitting museum benches and gallery by gallery, he created just one, um, which is a bit like a throne, I think. It was made specifically for our curator, Virginia. <laughs> but whoever <clears throat> sits there, of course, becomes part of the display. And uh, that play of reversing things, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, has been an interest of yours for a long time. It just became a moment where you could sort of make a gesture like, you know, this, you, you are the display, <laughs> or you can be. Um, one of the things that, I, that was interesting to me about this was the way you chose to try to break up the rectilinear as much as possible and 
really destroy the room um, in the sense of the curtains and uh, the lamps actually give you a completely enveloping and different sense of space. Um, for me, it was interesting because, you know, we think of this, that pre-Columbian art and Latin American art of later times is a significant break. Uh, there, there is a difference in a post-Columbus uh, era, and somehow uh, the work seems to let you feel that without needing to say it, that you're in one very strange world. And I'm curious whether the strangeness of that is uh, partly motivating that. Um, I don't know. If they, they're odd things, but they're also very, things that are that you know they, they're very familiar within in in, in in a museum context. I mean, it's sort of you 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 know like a, most museums have. I mean, museums of, of the scope of LACMA have a pre-Columbian collection, and and you sort of uh, you, there's a repertoire in your head that you have of these things. What I was I, what I was interested in trying to do was to kind of set up a kind of a visual spectacle within within the, within within the space with them and about them, but that really, was really more about a kind of a phenomenological exchange and not necessarily a, a kind of a thematic exchange because I really don't, I don't sort of manage that information with any sense of, of expertise. And I just think that, uh, you know, it's in more traditional methods of presentation, you, you kind of stay in the place shorter, unless you're interested in reading and, the, and then you read these things and you sort of, after a while you, you find yourself reading and you sort of play this game where you read and you look, you read and you look, you read and you look. And, and this, this project proposes a, a, a different type of duration that's, that your experience can sort of inhabit with the work. And, and, it's, and it's about the way a place feels. Or, and, it doesn't, and at the same time, it has, still has all the information that, that's in a typical presentation of this type of material. But hopefully the, 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 the spectacle, of, the phenomenological spectacle actually kind of does this, is this sort of remainder that, uh, that makes a different kind of time. So. I'm also just a... In, in terms of making the project, um, I think we talked about this, but yeah, I think you told me there was something like 12,000 individual pieces of wood that were cut and assembled, and... There were a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and what people don't know is it was, it was all made right here in L.A. in the studio, and uh, one thing that's been very interesting for me in this project is in other projects we've worked on, I've been in New York and so was not close to the studio, but here I got to go back and forth and see how you have a lot of people working on these things, and it seems to be an incredibly collaborative process within the studio. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can say something about how you work, because I, I think you get the image of a painter who sits in a studio and paints themselves, or a sculptor, but you really don't work that way. No, I, I don't work alone. I haven't worked alone for many, many years. Um, you know, it's this, this was a lot, we did it all in the studio, and it, uh, it, it almost broke us. So <laughs> this is kind of the largest project we've ever done. So. And, you know, there are a lot of different people, you know, that, that do different things. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I, how do I say, I mean, I think, I never liked the, work, the term collaborative. I've kind of grown to like it more as I get older. But um, I, always think, I always think that the, the reality of it is, is you know, it's, it's, a, it's a studio, and the, and the studio is sort of like a, it's like a film or something like that, where you have you have a kind of a director who directs the movie, you have all these people that are specialists and they do really good, and sometimes the specialists sort of inform things that you don't expect and vice versa, and, and, but it's, it's kind of all done as a, as a, as a kind of a, almost like a cinematic project, really, more than, than, uh, than a typical kind of I have an idea and then we do it. It's, 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 I tried to make the studio a place where everyone who's sort of involved at, at whatever level they are, they still have enough room to experiment within their field, and then it's, it's my job to sort of, you know, help that along or guide it and, and or you know find some way to kind of implement it when I can and uh, so it is in the end it's sort of like I said I, I really I don't like the word collaborative but at the end it probably is pretty collaborative because we work together and uh, you know we, I couldn't have done this with, without the people that I have I have a really good team right now so and do you do that in part as a critique of the sort of romantic ideal of a artist working alone in the studio it seems like you have a very matter-of-fact understanding about the world working that way too. Is it, is it conscious in that sense or is it just a way to get the work done? I think it's just, it's just a kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a product of, a, of, of being a sculptor. I mean, to a certain, I mean, you know, you can't, you, if you paint, you can sort of make things by yourself and, you know, hire a student or something like that. But it's, if you actually kind of put, want to make things that actually uh, embody a kind of a, 
a complexity that, that, that has to do with, with, with the world and things like that, you, need, you can't do it yourself. You have to kind of figure out a way to kind of uh, produce these things. And, and if, you know, if you're ambitious in any way, you, you're, you're, you're gonna, you, know, you have to learn how to work with other people. And what about the role of, I mean, you look at things like this and they look, a lot of your work looks extremely organic in form or handmade, but in fact, uh, technology plays a huge role. I think that a lot of your, the work you've done in the last several years couldn't have even been possible without computers and lasers and all sorts of tools. I there's, there's a lot of handwork in this work. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, but, but you're right, the, but the, but the uh, but they're conceived sort of digitally and, and you know, the, the, the studio is sort of set up to really kind of take advantage of that, and uh, you know, we, we cut it all in the studio, and uh, I don't know if there's 12,000 pieces, but there's probably a lot. <laughs> Seemed like it. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's it's something that you don't really notice. It's it's not so much the number of pieces, but it's it's the uh, irregularity in the pieces that, that that really kind of make it pretty crazy. It's, it's you know, there's each there's about 50 cases, and and each one is is different. I mean, it's sort of it's. It's sort of done with a script and there's the same sort of format for how it holds together and things like that. But but it's literally like, you know, it's it's a mapping of these shapes that each at every eight feet sort of moves a little bit and it changes. And uh, yeah, I mean I don't you know, I really don't see the distinction between using your hands and and and, and using a robot or, or using a friend or using or using your mother. So, you know, it's 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 about getting the thing you want to get she was made. here working on it. So, you know, it, it's, I, I don't think, I, I've, I've never really, luckily I've never really been burdened with that kind of drama, you know, within my production. I, I, I mean, I think it's nice to kind of have, you know, to fickle around and stuff, but it's not, it's not what I'm interested in. But, but you tend to want to do the work in the studio. I, I think that there are just so many artists today who order their work by mail or by email um, and have it manufactured, and yet you seem to be on exactly the opposite course, taking more and more of the manufacturing in the studio. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert at, uh, at, uh, at, you know, AutoCAD or any of that stuff, or, and then I can barely run my own machines, but, but the fact that I'm there and I'm embedded in the process, and that, I mean, I think to me the most important thing about having a studio, in it, which is a pain in the ass because you have a lot of people that you gotta worry about, and, and these machines break and there's deadlines and all this stuff, but it's super fun too. And is that, you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the play, I'm, I'm inside of all this technology. I'm not outside of it. And, and I think that's the difference that you're talking about that, you know, a, a lot of people have ideas about how things should be and, and they have sort of, you know, oh, this person can do that and whatever. And they get sent and then it comes back and it's totally different than what they had in their head. This, this stuff is not about what's in my head, it's about what's, in, what's possible in my studio. And the projects are all, the, you know, they're, they're sort of like a, the, the, uh, the, the form that these, the, the, these things sort of can take has everything to do with being able to control certain methodologies and certain processes. And that's, that's sort of what I'm interested in. So. This is not the um, first time that you've um, worked with museum or art spaces. This is a project that you did in, at the Caixa in Madrid, right, uh, in 2004. Um, which you think this installation was controversial, um, where you <laughs> took these incredibly minimal ar artworks uh, of 60s and 70s, there's a Donald Judd right in the middle there, and behind the paintings put these incredibly uh, red, orange colored walls that have a typography to them and these incredible lamps. And I'm curious about that relationship. I know how much you actually appreciate that artwork, um, in a very direct way because you have been very close to it. Yeah. And at first people think of it as being a, a very aggressive move to compete with the artwork, but actually it was a very interesting experience to see this extremely minimal work this way. So I'm kind of curious what was in your head. You know the artworks, you know the artists, some of them. Um, how did you approach that and how do you feel about the issue of whether it competes or works with the object? Um. I think they look better like this. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, some so, so many of the images that uh, the, the reproductions of minimalist art or minimalist work is, it's sort of uh, they, they they have a really dramatic they come with a really dramatic background anyway. I mean, it's, uh, there's 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 so many images of uh, of you know like a, like a Donald Judd box in a castle or something like that, or even Marfa is a very dramatic sort of backdrop for those works, and that's sort of about that's sort of how it works. I mean. It's just a, it's it's a it's a very straightforward polemic. I mean, you sort of you sort of, you, you got a box, and you have this sort of aesthetic flourish, 
and then you sort of have this dialogue that's, that's, that, that maybe spits out certain, uh, certain kind of conventions and beliefs that people have about what, an, what a sort of an ideal framing for this kind of work is, and that's sort of what the work does, is it, uh, you know, it, it, it outputs, possibly, hopefully, if it works well, it, is, it sort of outputs certain prejudices about what sort of an ideal presentation of the work could be, or something like that, so. Um. These are all, these are like ours, a temporary installation, and one of the things that was interesting for me was that idea of if you have a permanent collection, it means that you'll see it for years, decades, even centuries, and so I felt somehow even an obligation to, um, we always have an obligation to rethink our objects, because even though they're permanently in our collections, the idea is hopefully that we see them differently every day. And I think the environment has a lot to do with that. I mean, I, I sort of think that we, this, some of this work is very much about having a consciousness of a three-dimensional environment um, versus an, another era where maybe it was less so with paintings and frames. And Donald Judd is somebody who very much played with that. Is, is that a big influence? Do you feel that there is a sort of fundamental change? I mean, it's odd, of course, that, that a lot of people are going back to painting now, but there is a big move in the last um, decades to work in three dimensions. I mean, I think it's gotten probably easier to work three-dimensionally because I don't think, I don't think it's a, the, the question of like, you know, sculpture and painting and, and photography and all that stuff is, is those, those things are a mess right now, so it's not really about, and, 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 and for good reasons. I mean, it's like, I mean, you know, Thank God that, uh, that that form is not necessarily what drives how to look at something anymore, which, which is a, which is a dead. It was a dead end in the '50s. Is a dead end now. Um, it's just it's it's really more. A, I mean, one of the problems you see when you see Donald Judd's work is uh, you you sort of see it in, in in a singular fashion, and when you go to Marfa, you realize that that, that uh, you know like this this really sort of elaborate and highly sort of fabricated object, kind of a is really serving this other purpose, this purpose of like the shift from the one that's, that's got the piece an inch and a half away or something like that. that there's, a kind of, there's a kind of musicality when you see like 50 boxes that, that, that are supposedly as a box, I don't mean anything, but then you sort of see them in, in, in play in a scenario or in, a kind of a the, in, the, in this kind of a installation theater that he sort of comes up, but you realize that, that, that it's, it's, it's the same type of drama that I'm deploying in this, in this kind of space. It's, it's, just, it's, a, it's just totally, it's different because it, uh, you know, a lot of the cliches about what these materials are, are supposed to represent are so deeply embedded in, the, in these right. objects that it's very difficult to kind of li lift and separate those things. And that's sort of what my job is to do, is to, is to kind of really kind of, you know, flatline all these sort of assumptions, which to me are kind of worthless, so. I know you've also worked with, this was a project I really enjoyed, where you actually worked to create a setting for film. Um, but the relationship that was so important in this, these structures with uh, colored gels and the film being played, seemed to me that it was less about the film. You could play any film there, but it was more about the people um, who were watching the film. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, to a certain degree, I mean, it, 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 this project is sort of interesting because I was, what I was interested in doing is sort of, to, this is this is uh, to put it in context. This is this is a piece that was done for a sculpture show. It was it's, and it's a it's a sculpture show that was done in this very, in this very sort of nice park in the city in Braunschweig, Germany. And uh, what I what I proposed was a theater. And, and the reason I proposed a theater is because I wanted I, I wanted to sort of uh, I was thinking about monumentality. I was thinking about what's I mean one of the one of the things that one of the most monumental things you can think about is 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 uh, everyone's sort of dependency on, on on the cinema and film and things like that, which is sort of completely naturalized. Sort of event that nobody nobody really questions whether somebody why you would go you could go see a movie it's just it's a sort of natural thing that it occurs and what I wanted to do was sort of take that and turn it into an object by by sort of placing the people in and looking at watching the movie and then at the same time you could sort of any and somebody who was out in the park could sort of have a, a kind of a, a perverse sort of sort of a, a potential to a, to objectify the people in the in the movie theater and and right. at the, and at the and at the same time make them sort of co-opt them in, into what this object is. And at the same time, they could watch the film, but the, the people watching inside could watch them. And it's, it was really sort of this, 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 this kind of play between how do you, t how do you take like, the gaze and turn it into an object? And, and this was just literalized through the conventions of, of, uh, of bucolic sculptural tradition. Right. So. Right. Well, you seem to... Um the one thing that's very clear about your work is that it always seems to be an incredibly complex series of convolutions, contradictions, contrary moves, reversals. Um, 
And there are so many things like that happening, triple reversal sometimes, and yet the end result is often within the context of an even useful and pleasurable object. It's exactly the opposite of what we think of as art that over the last century has been a, a challenging of assumptions. Your work, I think, challenges assumptions no less than a Duchamp, and yet you tend to couch it with a playfulness. I, I take this as an example of one of the first big projects of yours I saw which was at, uh, in Munster in Germany in 1997 at the Sculpture Project. Um, and this is a lake in the middle of Munster, and I think it's a every three-year sculpture fair was. Uh, and the idea was to invite artists to work in the landscape and all around the town, small town of Munster, which is known especially because um, um, it's a town where everybody rides a bicycle. So it's a fantastic little environment. And in the lake, uh, Jorge created this pier um, and as you see, you walk out the pier, and it's, a, it, it, it's very beautiful just in, in, in the water, and you walk out to the space, and then it's odd because it's not like a gazebo with open views. It's actually a very internal space, uh, and you have to go outside of that space to the stairs to get this uh, beautiful view of the lake. Uh, one of the b best parts of this is inside that little private space, which is closed in, is a cigarette machine. And that's the sort of conclusion of your walk out there. Uh, the implication, I guess, that then you, you go and you have a cigarette and look at the view. Or you, or you, watch, or you look at the machine. And... Or you look at the machine, which is a kind of sculptural object in itself. Yeah. <laughs> and the piece is interestingly made out of redwood from California. Rather it was. Than... It, got, it got changed to a, it, it kind of a... Oh, it got... The California redwood didn't do so good in the German winters. <laughs> <laughs> they rebuilt it. <laughs> they rebuilt it out of German oak. It's, it's, it still looks very good, though. <laughs> but, but that brings up a good point, because it's sort of, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that, that you have to consider when you, when you sort of, uh, that the work, when you put the work in public space, that there's a vulnerability to it, you know, and, uh, and when, when, this, when the exhibition was up, there was, a, there was the cigarette machine, and then something happened, and they got rid of the cigarette machine, and, and then it started to sort of, but the, the piece is still there. So, I mean, there, it, it becomes this sort of object for, for these kind of, uh, these sort of stories, and uh, and that's and, and and it's sort of you're not quite sure when the work ends and when it, when it begins this anymore because it's it's really the context was really about the show and and trying to trying to trying to make a kind of a again trying trying to sort of a neutralize any kind of like you know bucolic aspiration you might have be, uh, you know, as as a kind of an, an ex, a kind of an easier a kind of a direct experience with nature or something like that like I don't I don't I don't really Think that I don't look at a lake and think that it's beautiful because it's a lake. It is beautiful. It's interesting because the, the, for me, because because there's there's a factory down the way that's, that's dumping a bunch of shit somewhere, <laughs> and it's and it's that polemic right. that that allows you to kind of put into context, you know, the, all the, this sort of uh, you, know, you know this aspiration or to sort of lose yourself to some degree. So I think there's a lot of interesting <laughs> sort of I mean, and there's there's terror there's fear <laughs> there's all this stuff going on and I was I was just sort of trying, trying to make like this sort of mini gesture in, in this piece to sort of talk about those things. Well, it does seem I mean there's a lot of irony and playfulness in it. I I can't help but think you did this piece in Germany and you have this idea of you know like even a Caspar David Friedrich painting of the viewer and seeing behind the viewer out into the landscape and so you're seeing these viewers looking into this bucolic landscape of course in this case they're having a cigarette which sort of brings it up to date maybe but um, it's funny you have all those ironies going on and yet the piece as a totality is actually quite beautiful and the view quite nice and the experience quite pleasant yeah so is it's a nice the, lake Right. So is that pleasantness a is that a is that a conclusion that you feel it's, you need to come to, or is that no? It's it's not it's not a, it's not a crescendo in the work. It's really more like I think you kind of set up a scenario, and that scenario has a, generally those scenarios have a kind of a kind of a, a, a quite a, a, a quite sort of straightforward palpability, and within that space you, you try to sort of uh, begin to look at what it is and how how it's how it's set or what what the site is about and what what it's trying to do, and you sort of unravel it and. Hopefully, if you've done your job right, you, you sort of get all these other sort of narratives that uh, undermine or reverse or, right. or sort of implicated in these other kind of discourses. But you are playing a little bit with that history of art, of recent art, that has been to be challenging intellectually, it has to be difficult. Is that? No, I don't believe that. That's, that's, that's what I, doesn't that's, I was... I was trained to believe that, but there was a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I mean. No, I think kind that's, of, you've, you've I, actually, I, you have really I think things gotten that are, rid things, of that problem. I think things that are interesting are usually inherently pretty complex. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, but I don't sort of, I don't think that, you know, like, uh, I, don't, I don't think that the artworks are 
totalized by certain groups of people. I think, I think uh, you know, artworks are a series of contingencies, and, and, the, and the way they're consumed, they're consumed through contingencies, you know. Certain people, people bring their sort of ideological stuff to them, and, uh, and some, of them are, some, of those, some of those ideologies are much more productive than others, I mean, but it's, at the end of the day, it's a peer. Right. And it's a peer that one sort of unravels when you start to ask questions about where it came from, who made it, why, when, right. where, all those things, and, and the, work, the work sort of arises from those types of questions. But at the end of the day, it's a peer. Right. So. Um, it was the peer that inspired uh, Dia's curator, Lynn Cook, where I was director, to want to have you do a major project at Dia in New York. And that resulted in a lo very long process of discussion. Um, that's how I met you. And yeah, we spent about three years doing We spent three years doing this. And uh, my first reaction was to expand the project from being inside the gallery, because I, I guess I kind of saw that you were working with the frame of reference and asked you if you would go ahead and just change the doors and the entrance and rearrange the coat check, and you ended up designing everything, the coat check, the uh, ticket-taking desks, the bookstore, and in fact, um, on the left you see the bookshop, and then on the right you see the gallery, which is definitely not a white cube that Dia had been for many, many years. In fact, Dia in New York was the quintessential white cube, and this was a very, I guess, conscious, contrarian move. Um, and uh, if you see in this photograph, um, separating the bookstore and the gallery is just a glass wall of storefront. So this was a fantastic project. We were talking about it internally, and I even ended up talking about it in a board meeting. And they, a lot of people wondered, well, wasn't I all about art and never wanted a bookstore? And why would Dia have a bookstore in it, and especially one that was so uh, prominent? And uh, the answer was for me that, of course, we were doing the opposite. We had actually turned the ticket-taking disc, the coat check, and the bookstore, and the very doors you walk through into an artwork. So we had fully fulfilled the mission to not have space that was not art space by uh, creating a dialogue within this, with the, that was totally encompassing. It was interesting. I know you work closely with Lynn Cook on this, uh, on thinking about what also what would be shown there, and you both decided to show a model the clay model of the new VW Beetle, um, which is a quite fantastic object in itself. And in this one move, when we opened this show, uh, not only had Dia's image of being the quintessential clean white box space been turned completely upside down, but you see there was this essential reversal also of all the non-art spaces, the floors, the wall, the bookstore, the ticket desk, became the art, and the one thing that was in the middle, shown as an art object, became the design object. And it wasn't an art object, it was a more functional object. Yeah, but it was, and it was all, it's, uh, it's also, it was all, it was, it was, it was constantly melting. <laughs> That's true, the clay wanted to melt, it was a little bit it's, of a problem. It's made from this auto, uh, auto, automobile clay that basically has to be at like 72 degrees or something like that, and if it doesn't, so I mean, I was, I, 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 I was really interested in, in, in the fact that this is this is an object that really implied motion on a, on a lot of different levels, and the, the motion of the, the motion of the of the transformation of the space, and and kind of you know like re setting up a kind of a an aesthetic polemic between the tradition of of of, uh, of Dia, which was uh, you know completely sort of embedded in in this very polite, very sort of concretized way of uh, of uh, setting up a reverential s situation. With the space, not allowing, not al I mean, you know, it's the classic German. You know, you, you take a building and you, you you clean it and you do as little as possible, and then and all that is done because the, the what, what's really real is the art. And I've never really been able to sort of believe that. I think my problem has always been like, where does the, I have a hard time sort of understanding or where the art stops, or where it starts, and uh, that's that's sort of like the the quintessential problem that, that this show has is is that is it does the show actually like it, at some point it, it sort of started to kind of melt into, into all the shops in the street and there was a kind of you know and, and, and there was and there was a, a kind of a, a little bit of a schizoid polemic about whether this was a real dia show or not or like that you know the dia had sold out it's sort of and it's and it has it has only nothing to do with that it's just kind of looking it's a show that tries to look at the tradition of 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 uh, of, of the of places exhibition tendencies and, and try to propose a kind of a, a kind of a palpable way to do that. It worked. It was incredibly successful, not only in sort of taking an image of Dia and turning that upside down, but in people enjoying the bookstore and spending much more time in the space. And what we hadn't counted on because it was a temporary exhibition 
is that we were able to do three more shows of other artists in the space, and they all loved it. So it was funny that you take what you think you need to have, which is the perfect white cube, and especially if you're being reverential or appreciative of artists and their own work, and it turned that artists loved working in the space. In fact, Gerhard Richter had a show, and it was all based on glass and mirrors, so it played with the space, and then um, Zorio had a beautiful sound piece that you made curtains for and then yep. collaborated with that artist. And you collaborated with us as curator, director, too. I, yeah. It seems like your collaboration extends not only within the studio, but within the context within, your work, within which you're working. Yeah, Lynn picked all the works, and it was sort of like back and forth. And, and it's sort of, you know, I kind of, once the space is done, I sort of, I sort of stepped out of the way. And it became really interesting to see what, uh, what would happen with the different, different curatorial gestures of the, of the show. There, um, to talk about those reversals, th this is a fantastic piece that I loved, which was in the Royal Festival Hall in London. And um, there was a story, it's a sort of a sailboat, as you can see, a tip tipped to fit inside the lower ceiling. And I remember this story, it was actually, Lynn Cook had been there behind a very famous artist, very well-known artist, contemporary artist in his late 50s and overheard this conversation between, actually there were two artists, and they looked at this piece, they walked around it, and they said, I'm not sure what this is, but it's definitely not art. Um, I guess it was a sailboat, but in fact, it is and it isn't. So, <laughs> I don't know if you could say a little something about how this piece came to be, this idea of, is it a sailboat, isn't it a sailboat? I mean, it is Why a sailboat. Why isn't it a museum? It is a sailboat, it's, 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 it's in the Royal Festival Hall. You know, at the time, I was very interested in, in sailing, and, uh, and uh, until I, until I scared myself. <laughs> but I was still very interested in boats. You gotta sail outside the museum, though, it helps. No, I know. That's a, and, uh, but what I was, uh, this particular boat is, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a Bill Lee design, which is, a, which is Santa Cruz 27, the hull of it is. And, and the top we redid and did completely differently. And, and what I was interested, this this type of boat was a was a boat that that uh, came out of the 70s in southern in northern California and uh, it sort of kind of rewrote the class rules for racing and, and uh, it was really more about technology and speed and pleasure and, and not not so much driven by by uh, by racing classes and uh, it just and it seemed like it's there was there was, the person who made it was this really eccentric guy every time he'd make a boat he'd he'd wear like a wizard outfit and stuff like that and and break a bottle. <laughs> but, but to me, it sort of embodies probably the most interesting thing about living in California or, or coming to California from the, from the East Coast is that there were these kind of really highly productive freaks out here. <laughs> and, Which uh, you're now one. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's really, I mean, and, and it's sort of a discom it's, I mean, that, that sort of anecdote that I just sort of uh, gave you about that is, 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 is kind of not necessarily connected to, to the experience of the boat in the, in the exhibition, except that there may be these two spectacles that are trying to sort of kind of uh, insinuate in themselves into each other, which may or may not be possible. So, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that this, this piece is trying to do is sort of, sort of, you know, I had sort of embedded all this sort of energy into this object, and it's like, and let's see what happens when, let's see what it can carry or what it can't. Now, this boat actually doesn't sail very well because you've you it modified. Actually, no, it sails pretty good. Does it? Yeah, it's it's kind of it. We in Miami we put it in 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 the, in the water and then the guy ferrying it out hit hit the bottom and <laughs> sunk with it. It was. Fun. Um, so so is there a line? Where's the line between art and design? Is is the boat and sculpture? Is it in and of itself? Is it a sculpture because you've placed it there? What? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the architecture and design tradition here in California? That I, th I think that those those that line of question is is a is a kind of a. It's unfortunately this this sort of this kind of uh, kind of impotent kind of debris that's left over from uh, from looking at looking at uh, looking at works through form or just purely through form. That the idea that that. Uh, that 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 aren't an, an artist uh, that, that that these differences between an artist who's a painter and a sculptor or a filmmaker um, that the really the, the, the these things kind of define themselves through the specificity of their form mm -hmm. and you know somebody from my generation or I hope I think who's awake has would have a really hard time sort of seeing that as a, as a, as anything other than post-war fantasy. So I mean I I I really don't think that the question is whether where, where does it start to be designed. I mean, you know, art has always had design in it. You, 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 I mean, you, you, you got to construct a picture. You got to, you know, you, you got to, you got to make. I mean, 
It's a question of like, what is, what is the, you know, what, what do you want to say? I mean, what, do you want to, what are you trying to look at when you're making work? And my work just happens to, uh, to, to, to use, uh, you know, a lot of different things to, uh, as instruments to kind of ask sort of questions about how you look. So. The, um, you've asked always, again, these contrarian moves. Um, and we, you talked a little about this sailboat being made here in Southern California, and I know it's meant you've spent a lot of time now in California and thought about the traditions of Southern California, have been very ingrained in it, and now built a number of projects. This is, um, if you haven't been there, you should go, but this is the Mountain Bar, which is right here in LA. It was finished in 2003, um, and it's exactly that. It's a bar, uh, and you can go there and get a drink. Uh, you can also, it, it functions a little bit as an art school. Um, the idea, I guess, is you can, there are classes that are taught there over drinks or discussions which are had. No, with it's, a, it's a proper art school. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not even so disheveled anymore. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the mountain bar. it's actually interesting. I mean, these two, guys, these two artists put it together and uh, they have like, uh, they have, it's, it doesn't always center around the bar, but it's sort of, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting speakers that go. And, and that's one of the, I mean, that's kind of been, that's kind of been the only really interesting uh, kind of wing that's come out of, out of, the, out of the bar, other than, you know, you, you can go there and get a drink and stuff like that, and it's actually an interesting place to be. But, but it, is, it is kind of interesting the, the, way, the way the bar is sort of collected, like a difference and like this, this school, and it used to be my studio, and, uh, you know, thinking about maybe opening a restaurant upstairs. I mean, we'll see. But I mean, this is this is this project was sort of just started as it used to be my studio, and it, and it was a it was a really a popular bar in the seven and actually from probably from the, after the war on, and uh, my friend Steve Hansen and I and and uh, other friend Mark McManus we thought we would uh, actually Steve Hansen and I were the ones who thought we we'd open the bar and then Mark was sort of a architect guy not really he's sort of in between he's an architect now but. And uh, he, he kind of came on board, and we just thought it would be interesting to have a bar, because Chinatown at the time was sort of uh, was, was, was being inhabited by a lot of artists and galleries and things like that. So. And uh, it just ended up being what it is. And, and you know, it's every, every year, uh, I change the lights. I put new lamps in. And we have an auction at the Christmas party. That for, uh, you can buy a $5 ticket. And it's, it's, it's great, actually, now when you have... Uh, I, I see a lot of young art historians and critics, and on their resume will be Mountain Bar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's insane that people are actually... Los Angeles education like, system. on their resume, they have Mountain Bar. <laughs> um, you know, the, we say these things in a, in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way, but in fact, I think the questions you've raised about inside and outside the museum, where does an artwork begin, where does a design object begin, you seem to just dance along boundaries. I think of a lot of your work as a, as a sort of a, literally a dance around the boundaries of art, architecture, design, inside the museum, outside the museum, and by this elaborate uh, dance, you seem to have uh, captured not only the interest of the whole art world, but helped, to, uh, helped us to think about those definitions and, and, and what the problems with definitions are. Um, I think there was a huge amount of controversy and discussion when you made this exhibition for LA MOCA. They invited you to do an exhibition, and instead of doing an exhibition inside the museum, um, you decide to build a house. In fact, you built your own house. It's yeah. 4166 Seaview Lane, and uh, you still live there. Um, and this was your project. Yeah. And it was open for a time uh, as part of the museum's exhibition program. And then you moved in. Yeah. Uh, and then I would ask, is it still an artwork now that it's your house? It, yes, with a straight face, yes. <laughs> No, it is. It's it's you know it's an, it's a project. I mean, when it was uh, you know when I when I was uh, when I was invited to do a show at, at Mocha in nineteen I think ninety three, um, I, I was I was asked to do a focus show, and uh, I thought well, and, and the focus shows are like these kind of little galleries that, that museums sort of started in the in the nineties where they could sort of kind of do diminutive shows or or shows about very specific artists that that maybe were not as well known or some that were young. And I just, I just, I was, I was, uh, I was, I was, I was more ambitious than that. I was interested in like the idea that okay, here's a museum show. It's like they're, it's like I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do a stupid focus show. I want, I want to do a real show. And it's like at, 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 at the same, I wanted to sort of think about how do you rescale something? How, like how, 
how much control does an artist have in their ability to scale their own, their own production in, in an exhibition, which is, which is already about scale anyway, because you know, uh, when, it, when, when museums ask you to do shows, it's, it's you know, every, every, every one of your creepy dealers sort of comes around and, and, try, and, and, and that what they want is the value of the work to go up, and that there's a certain kind of scaling, you know. So, I, I mean, it seemed, it seemed like, a, like a proper kind of investigational mode to, to, to kind of pursue that. I said, I want to make a house. I, don't want, I, want, I want the museum, but I want, to, I want to tether it to the museum, but I want the questions that come from this project to be larger than what the scope of this space is. Right. And that's, that's where it came from. You actually, the, the house is quite a fantastic object in and of yeah. itself. There you go. Um, and I was surprised, not surprised, in fact, I saw, uh, when I, f first of all, when I saw your house, it started me thinking about the fact that these houses are, can be sculpture, which uh, forced me to think about the other tradition of small domestic houses in Los Angeles that I know you were thinking about when building this house, and how any small house like this, like the Neutras or the Schindlers that we look at, have all these sculptural properties. And while yours was thought about in a more, in a different way in terms of its organization and a different way formally, it does raise that fundamental question that got me thinking, well, we ought to have a collection of houses. Um, it makes perfect sense. They're sculpture, and there's no difference between looking at that and looking at a sculpture or a painting. Um, I saw, this is the kitchen, which you, is quite fantastic. And then this is not the kitchen, but this is a picture of the kitchen with a, a uh, piece of furniture in front of it. In front that, of it. that was oh, another kitchen. This is a, uh, oops, sorry. So there's three kitchens. <laughs> yeah, this is a picture of your kitchen. This is another piece of furniture from another kitchen. And this is in an exhibition in Miami where you did a bit of a mini retrospective and uh, used the images of your other houses and other projects as backdrops for, um, again, functional objects. I think like triple reversing the <laughs> process. Yeah, the show was kind of, we, we tried to sort of um, set a kind of a scenario so that, so that you could sort of walk through the, through the pieces, and not necessarily chronologically, but, but more thematically so that they would fit in. So we thought, okay, we'll make a house out of, or we'll use the theme of a house, and we'll, just, we'll, just pr we'll use all the different sort of uh, exhibition images and, and uh, places where I lived and, and, and kind of present the scenario that, that then these objects could be placed in and some of these objects were the same objects that were already in the picture, some of them weren't, so it's, it was just a way to kind of, again, to, to, uh, to make your experience of moving through the history of the things that I'd done more palpable or more sort of more interesting. Which it did. It was really brilliant in that, again, how many times can you reframe the question and still get a new answer? I mean, to me, the most interesting thing about it is that everything looked the same. Like, you really couldn't tell what was made what. <laughs> When, when it was made, it was a sort of like it just kind of right. flat against chronology for yeah, sure. Yeah, flatlined everything. It was really good. You've actually become an architect uh, in some ways. I know that you were commissioned uh, to build a house in Puerto Rico, and it was finished recently and published, and it's quite fantastic uh, with uh, similar vocabulary in terms of use of uh, some of the colors and materials, tiles. This is a fantastic pool where the color of tile gradates from one side to another. Traditional use of concrete. Um, these are these fantastic windows that are made out of, I guess, cut pieces of pipe, right? That yeah, you just made like they slice them sliced pipe and then here. welded them together. Um, so, how do you feel about being an architect? Does it? Is, is I like it. it. <laughs> it's, pretty, um, <laughs> it's pretty good, you know. It, it, I mean, again, it, I was. When I did the project at, 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 at MOCA, I was thinking about the house as, as a kind of a, a very particular type of lens with which to look at other motions that I've done in my work to, up to that point. I mean, this is a little different because this, this, this I was asked to do this about four or five years later by uh, these very nice, crazy Puerto Rican collectors who, who showed up one time in, at a show and said, I'd never met them before, and I'd heard about them, they're very nice, and said, we want you to design a house for us and make our house. And I went, well, that's great. <laughs> I'm not an architect. <laughs> and, and, I, and I thought they were kidding. And, and, then, and then a month later, I get back home, and they, they, they call, and they, they send me a ticket to go to their house. And I go, OK, well, let's go take a look. And, and, and we started this relationship. And in, through that relationship, I sort of learned, learned, learned how to become somebody who can make houses. I, I think calling myself an architect it still sounds very perverse to me. <laughs> uh, not simply because I don't have the training, because I don't, 
but it just seems that you know I'm not somebody who's vested in in uh, in the in the kind of uh, idealism of architecture in a sense. I don't I don't come from that tradition. I'm not. I didn't go to architecture school. I didn't. I didn't. You know. I don't. Uh, I don't know it. I don't understand it. I mean, I you know I have a lot of friends that are architects, and I, and uh, I don't really understand their field in the way they don't understand my field. And I think it's a very very significant discursive difference. But I am interested in architecture because. Um, LA has, has been, a, you know, historically somewhat impoverished in terms of like their their sort of local tradition, you know, collecting of, of arts. I mean, most of the people that, that kind of become interesting in LA, they end up their work ends up leaving, and uh, we don't really have a lot of very significant historical. We didn't. We had even less about 20 years ago. It's getting better now, but um, and it just seemed like these these houses that were, you know, at the time kind of abandoned were were these kind of these 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 things you could really respond to and, and kind of work off of and and uh, it was a lot more interesting to to go to your you know your friend's beat up Schindler house than than right. than to LACMA. <laughs> I, I've also <laughs> I've also noticed that um, you you have spent uh, this is Puerto Rico but you've also spent a huge amount of time in Mexico. Um, I've been with you many times. Yeah. You actually have built your own house in Merida in the Yucatan, um, and somehow uh, I mean. It's not as if your work is already colorful, but the further south it goes, it seems to get even more colorful sometimes. I don't know. I, I feel like you get some of that color uh, through those uh, excursions. And I know that Mexico has been important to you in the last several years in terms of your research and thinking about art and form. In fact, this is a um, sculpture that you did outdoors for a development in Guadalajara. Um, and I'm just curious about that relationship you've developed with Mexico recently. Um. It's a hard one to answer because I don't really. I like I, I I love going to. I mean I like Mexico. I love Mexico. I think it's 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 become a kind of an important part of my life. I mean I'm working there and and I, and I actually live there now. And, you know, um, my wife is Mexican. My daughter's half Mexican, so it's. Uh, but I you know I it's it's I kind of see it as an extension of living here. You know I mean I don't think that I don't think you know what I mean I think that it's one of the things I what it's. I mean, going if you live in Southern California and you don't go to Mexico, you're you're kind of an idiot. I mean, it's <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's it's an amazing place, and and I think uh, you know I don't necessarily I don't necessarily think that uh, that there's a color specific to Mexico or there's right. a color specific to the United States. I think color in the work always is always again it's sort of an instrument for a particular kind of effect, and uh, there are certain kind of tools or tricks that I've sort of, you know, have in my bag about with color and through color and things like that. And they kind of get deployed when you need them. But yeah. it's never, the work is never about color. It's never, you know, just like, you know, the, the, the idea of color is never, it's kind of essential, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, pri it's not about, it's not the primacy of the work. What's prime, prime about the work or what its primacy is, I should say. Although it does play a huge role. And I, I think of this as being almost like a giant lamp. And maybe to end, I wanted to show a few uh, images Oh, actually, this is a this is a hacienda, a ruin in the Yucatan that I guess you're working on right now to turn into a kind of abstract. Is it going to be a house, a living space? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a hacienda. It's a, it's a private uh, it's a private house, and the hacienda is in the Yucatan. The Yucatan has this tradition of these kind of very sort of eccentric and kind of grand haciendas, and um, there's a family in, uh, in Mexico that I work with who own quite a few of these, and, the, and through you and, a, and a, another person, uh, Jose, anyway, who wasn't that, I met them and we sort of actually hit it off, and we're working on a few of these, and this is the first one that we're working on. This is kind of just the, uh, the very first image without anything done to it, obviously, but, but it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to go and, and, uh, and kind of have, have this sort of historical object, which is which is kind of an interesting history because it's kind of a contemporary history, but it's also kind of embedded in, in how much older Mexico is than than, than the states, and uh, and uh, there's just a, there's just a, a crazy amount of opportunity that you have down there. So, I want to I want to open it up to some questions, but I first just want to end with a couple of images of lamps, and just ask you: you are known as the number one lamp maker in the world right now. I think somehow your lamps have captured the imagination of the art world, the design world. Um, I know there's a big tradition of lamps in architecture too. The latest lamp you can see uh, over here that Jorge made actually as a uh, benefit for the installation that is upstairs. It's, um, it's actually derived from one of the figures in the... <laughs> 
installation. In fact, there's, we were looking at this, I guess, when we were doing the tests, and um, it was kind of a fantastic figure. So you had it laser. I don't know how you, you actually made a 3D computer model. Yeah, you guys scanned cut. it, and then we, we, we cut it and, and uh, put a bunch of holes in it and then kind of made a cavity for it and turned it into a, into a lamp. So it's... Pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Actually. <laughs> uh, so, what about lamps? You seem to have made more lamps than anyway. This is a piece called Penelope, right? Who's, which is yep. named after your daughter that was in Liverpool. Um, and uh, I just this is I could have shown one of a thousand slides. I won't go the, through the thousand lamps. What's the obsession with lamps? Here's the uh, Gagosian Gallery, which is a series of fantastic. They're, nice, they're, lamps. Sort of like, they're like sort of like making drawings. I mean, they're just they're simple. They're things that uh, you know, like they're they're they're. The technicality is pretty straight. Well, you can kind of you can wake up in the morning and design a lamp, and it's done in the afternoon. So I mean, it's whether it's good or not, it's a whole other thing. But but it's this thing that you kind of can you can use to kind of uh, you know work through a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of problems and, and something. That, and you can sort of use different parts of it to do other things. It's just and it's also they're really nice. I mean, the lamps are like these things that uh, they have their own sort of perceptual mechanism in them. You know, they're they're either uh, when they're on you can see them, when you're off they can't. You can't. So I mean, it's sort of it's, they have this sort of really kind of elegant but sort of kind of tragic phenomenon. <laughs> Little th and they're just, they're just, they're fun to make and they're interesting to do and, and a lot of times, I mean, I don't really have a, a regular drawing practice. I don't really, you know, I don't paint. It's like, it's, and it's, lamps are kind of like these things you can kind of, you know, I don't always, I don't always make them myself, but they're one of the few things I could make by myself <laughs> and I do from time to time. These are lamps that are actually made, I guess they're scans of the, of the, the studio, right? Everybody in the studio gets yeah, a lamp. Yeah, this is a... This Portraits. Is a, everyone in... <laughs> Portrait the, lamps. Well, I thought it would be nice to make an exhibition where that, that was kind of lit by the people who made it. It's a really nice idea. And this is in the um, Bundestag in Berlin. That is the sort of governmental... Um, I guess it's the legislature. And this is the cafe, right? Their yeah. main restaurant there. Um, and it was seeing this and some of those other projects that inspired, and the DIA project that inspired us to um, ask you to collaborate with us on our new LACMA West renovation. And the plan is that we would hope to work together collaboratively uh, with the staff and with architects and uh, with uh, that building and find a few spaces which will be you know, invaded by art even though they're functional spaces. And we're talking about several different kinds of spaces within the building. Um, uh, but this one is a, a kind of very beautifully representative of how you've used light and form to completely transfer, transform space, and you are literally in an artwork. Um, I, maybe there we should turn the light. I know it's getting late, but we should turn the lights up and ask for some questions or thoughts or opinions or things people are interested in. Anything? Other ideas? Um, let's, I, I I'll repeat that. Oh, sorry. Squares. Now, what's your favorite material? And oh, the tiles. Well, those are, yeah, those are ceramic tiles. Ceramic tiles, which were made in Mexico. Actually, they were made in Guadalajara. Ah, we have a microphone, actually, if there is any. We have a question here in the middle. <laughs> Pass it down, that's good. Hi, um, I, I just want to go back to the, the reinstallation of the exhibition here. Um, this is totally based on my personal feeling, but I felt when I walked in that something, and I don't know if it was the drapes, but something felt kind of oppressive to me. And I don't know what it is, but why, why did you choose to put the drapes up at the top? Oh, because the, the, the space above, the, above the, the cases were sort of just have this kind of funny looking thing, and it just seemed really unresolved, and the, and the, uh, the drapes kind of softened the whole thing up quite a bit. Okay. So I guess just why not go all the way up the wall with the wood, or why not paint the walls? Like, is it just the texture, or...? It, well, it, we thought about that, but I mean, the thing is, it's, then it sort of becomes, I mean, it, it stops being a case or something, and then it becomes like a wall or something, and it's still, and I also thought, you know, when the, the, the space above the gallery, it was just a kind of another place you can, like, put some other types of information on in there, so in other words, it's sort of like, uh, it's nice to have fabric above, above that, 
object that sort of runs through the room. I don't, I don't think, I mean, it's a, uh, but I, I, you know. I can say it was partly brought, born out of some practical necessity that another amount of wood all the way up to the ceiling would have really busted the budget and time. <laughs> and we did look for other solutions. And it was interesting how you brought fabric and curtains in, which of course has this great tradition in museum galleries, uh, which do feel, if you think of 19th century galleries, and they do have a little of that feeling of the intense color and use of fabric, and they do feel a little bit darker and more contained. Um, and uh, it is, it's, it is enveloping in that sense. And I, I think the curtains helped it actually quite a bit. It was, I mean, we never really designed it to go all the way to the top. But we, when, when we put the first ones in, we realized oh, was, we have to deal somehow with the space above the, the case. And that was sort of just a, one, of the way, one of the things you can do. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I still haven't seen the, the um, exhibition, although I'm Colombian. Um, I'm just interested to find out how, seeing the Procolumian art, how did you come up, how did the concept um, um, come into, how did you decide that that would be the right casing for, I mean, the concept behind it, seeing the Procolumian art and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do as casings, how did, it, how did it start? I'm just always curious to see what sparked that design to go with the Procolumian art. Um. It wasn't, it wasn't really a concept. It was, I just started squiggling on the computer, <laughs> and, uh, and, which is what you do. And it's sort of like, you know, and then you start to kind of make these different things, and some of them actually start to kind of, you know, present better possibilities than the other ones. But, uh, but again, I, I, what, I was, what I wanted to do was sort of set up, set up a kind of a, a polarity between uh, a more traditional sort of casework, which is a casework that where each object sort of... Uh, gets a, a very sort of uh, kind of like a neoclassical presentation. You know, it gets like a, a case and it's, a, it's sort of like, you know, the, I wanted, I wanted the, uh, the, the way that you, that you kind of prop something up, the way the pedestal worked, to have a, a different type of, a, a different tone to it. So it wasn't just about make, trying to convince you that this is a serious object, but that, uh, you know, that I wanted it to be able to carry other in, more information than that, and because it's I think that's a big it's one of the problems with uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of the way a, 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 one of the it's one of the problems with the way that these objects a lot of times are, are displayed is that there's so much energy that goes into into uh, demonstrating their seriousness that that uh, there's so much and then there's so much information in the objects themselves that are so playful. And so much about the same kind of process that I'm thinking about in the studio that it's it's hard to sort of set up a kind of a, a contemporary equivalence of that, and that's what, that's something I was very interested in. Like yeah. I, I don't see myself any different than the, than the people making those little clay things. You know? No, I just think about the concept. But have you been invited um, to Colombia by any chance for your art? No, I, I haven't actually. Would you be interested? <laughs> sure, why not? Colombia's nice. You know, it as um, you know, Museo del Oro, uh, Botero is very much inclined. Uh, he did the whole casing in Medellin for. The, um, um, would has, have you been ever been invited to Colombia for any of the? Um... No, I've never. I've, I want to go to Colombia. It's kind of interesting. Okay. It's, it's, uh, but Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sounds you so perfect. much. Thank you. We have another. If you want to hand that back, I think there's another question. Maybe also just to add, um, one of the things that was interesting in terms of the decision to do this with with Jorge, for me, was also that is to raise the question of what the frame is. So often we go into museums and I think we're not sure what the, you know, what, is the framing device natural? I mean, obviously these pre-Columbian objects were never meant to be in museums. There were no museums. And so I'm frankly as interested as what happens to these objects to see them freshly when we put them in other cases or standard cases in the future. But this idea that um, you want to raise awareness about the issue of framing that everything is seen in a frame, even if it's a gray plexiglass case that has no cultural reference to a pre-Columbian object, nor does Jorge's. It's done completely in the present of our own design, uh, and it is an imposition, whether it's a gray case or it's a, a square case or it's curved case. And part of the impetus for me was to see that in action. And then we'll see what happens also since it's temporary. They'll go into another in environment and hopefully we'll have learned something interesting about the whole process. Go ahead. Yes. Question. Uh, what kind of things inspire your work? 
Is it nature? Is it color? What kind of things do you see and feel that inspire your work? I like nature. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Check. <laughs> I like color too. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer a question like that because um, I don't. You know, I, I don't know when not to be inspired. Because <laughs> everything's interesting. You know, it's, it's a question. You sort of just like you know, you walk around, you know, you're making breakfast, you see like a like a bug, you step on it. That's interesting. You know, it's, it's the nature it's, of being an artist. You know, it's, it's like so. I don't. You know, I, I don't. I don't. I. I think you kind of choose certain things to kind of investigate your level of interest in, but it's not really, I don't know if I, if I really use inspiration. I think if I've done my job well, um, I, I, it, the person thinks I'm very inspired. But, it's, but in terms of like, but it's better to talk about it kind of as an intensity that one has with one, when, when, when they're making something, whatever their process is, whether they're making with their own hands or whether they're working with a group of people like I do. But it's, uh, I mean, I'm more, I think it's better to talk about it that way. Is there one more question, maybe? Or we got a couple uh, Yes, yeah. thank oh, you. you got one. Uh, Mr. Pardo, would you talk about the choice of color in the different sections of the exhibition? Um, well, it was, the, 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 when we, we when when we decided to deploy color, I mean, it's, it's I mean generally when you when you when you have color, you kind of just you, you set up a system, and the system is arbitrary, in the sense that uh, you know. And then we sort of went back and forth, back and forth, and we decided we you know we, we sort of certain colors would work. And then once that that group sort of functioned, then it, it became like how do you sort of deploy, how do you sort of make a palette that actually. Uh, is either going to resonate or, or with dissonance or complement or or sort of set up a harmonic between the color and the object, or I, don't know. I think this group of color actually works very well with with the information that's on these objects and with the color of these objects and different things. So um, it's it's not really it's I'm not coming from the point of view of like this this green means whatever you know I'm I'm sad or what it's not symbolic. It's really a very it's a very sort of a pragmatic and uh, a, a kind of a visual sort of game that one plays between the thing that one wants to kind of either frame or, or, or kind of make recede or come forward with the color. And, and this particular group seemed to work really well with the objects for me. And it was sort of deployed through the curtains and through the backdrops. It was, it was a sort of an interesting device. Um, I'm just getting a sign that maybe we're, okay, time. Thank you, Jorge. Um, thank you all for Thank you thank very you much. And thank you all of you for being here this evening. Thanks. <laughs>